This is Mari, success coach, angel tarot card reader, and reconnective healer, coming to you from the base of Mount Shasta in McLeod, California. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Steve Simpson. I'm a mind coach, hypnotherapist, and fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine. And I'm speaking to you today from beside the Thames in beautiful London. Any show called Magic conjures up a powerful scene, for me, of Merlin, one of Harry, our producer's favorite. <laughs> also, the countless times in my life when magic has appeared on the scene. Now, I'll wave my magic wand and abracadabra, here is Dr. Steve in all of his glory, ready to continue our conversation on the next phase in our show relating to luck. Magic. Welcome, Dr. Steve. You are here through the magic of our universe, 6,000 miles away from me, and yet it feels like you're in the studio with me. Hello, hello, hello. Are you ready? Yeah, <laughs> I certainly am. Can't wait to get started on this one. And it truly is magic. And uh, I th likewise feel as if we're sharing the same studio. So, what is magic? Well, it's the seventh of the seven secrets, which means that unless something truly magical happens, this is the last of this particular section talking about luck. And if we combine all of the elements of the previous shows and mix in a bit of uh, magic or oofal dust, then that will be a very heady cocktail <laughs> indeed. <laughs> I love it. You know, magic to me is life. It, it's babies. It's nature. It's all of creation. I mean, look around you. When you look into nature, just for instance, Harry and I stepped out into the grass today. We took our shoes off and the grass was moist with the rain and it felt so good. It created magic for me, just a few steps in the grass, in the wet. That certainly was magic. In your bare feet with the wet grass, that uh, abundant energy from the earth would have been flowing through the soles of your feet, out through the top of your head, and turning everything to magic on its way. How about that? Oh, yes. And it's such a simple act. But we don't realize what importance it, it has in our lives just to take off your shoes and step onto the earth. Because when we get grounded, <laughs> there is so much more that we start to see in our lives and become one with the universe and recognizing all of the magic around us is it's just what is the beginning of creation for us as individuals. Well, that certainly is magic. I mean, I, I just got this picture of you. I can see you in your bare feet, the wet grass, the energy of the earth flowing up through the soles of your feet, right through every part of your body and coming out of the top of your head in a starburst of fireworks. Yeah, I'm not surprised you feel pretty good right now. <laughs> it's energy plus it's the best way to get your day started and you know truthfully it only takes a couple of minutes it's just like a thought we transfer our thoughts continually and if we realized how our thoughts create things <laughs> we would really be very careful what we're thinking about uh, perhaps we need to think a little bit more about love or compassion or and the energy that love can bring to the world. And all of these things are all connected. We think of a circle just going round and round. And what we can bring into our day is magic. It certainly is. Now, I've got something really surprising to tell you here, and it must come as a huge shock to both of you. That's a Harry, our producer as well. But, Mari, do you know there are people in this world who do not believe in magic? I, I, no, I don't believe. <laughs> I, knew, I knew you'd find this a shocker. 
<laughs> but it's true. And, you know, I, they will have their own view. Some people will have their views about me because I do believe in magic. But when you start talking to the most eminent scientists in the world, they believe in magic. Einstein believed in magic. Uh, and, and magic is, to my mind, it's something that exists for which we have no current scientific explanation. I was on my walk today as well, and it's spring in England, I'm glad to say, and I heard a cuckoo calling, and it reminded me of the cuckoo. Due to modern science, we can fit little gadgets on these birds now, and we can find out where they spend their time. Now, we, we always used to think that the cuckoo you know, perhaps went down to Europe or something like that and came back uh, for spring. But this cuckoo flies all the way to the same tree in the central African rainforests every year and flies all the way back. Now, this is not a autopilot on a 747. I'd like the people who uh, don't believe in magic explain to me how that cuckoo does it. And the same is true of salmons in the, in, salmon in the seas. The same is true of bees uh, who are communicating with each other where the honey is. These, to me, nature is full of magic. And if we don't embrace it ourselves, we are just missing out on so much I think of penguins, too. We all perhaps had the opportunity to see the film. I don't remember what it was called, but it was all about penguins and the journey they take. Just unbelievable. That if we pay t attention to what is going on in nature, we can take so many points from it and understand that we can create anything we choose if we do believe in magic. I know that throughout your life and throughout mine, we have created magic that uh, somebody who is a non-believer might say, well, the reason that happened was such and so and thus and this. And they always find a way to perhaps bend that story in, to suit their belief. However, it doesn't matter. It truly doesn't. When they finally step into that place of awareness and get the picture that they cannot explain this one, <laughs> then they will become a believer in magic. It only takes a moment but it can happen. Well, it can happen. Uh, we have to believe in miracles, don't we? And during your introduction, I was listening very carefully to you, as I always do, of course. And you said three very powerful words, and uh, I can remember uh, what they were. Uh, you said, thoughts become things. And um, I don't know whether you know this or not, but those three words are used exactly like that in this wonderful film, uh, The Secret. Thoughts become things. And, of course, people knew this long before anybody made a film called The Secret. Napoleon Hill knew about it in the 1930s when he wrote this book, Think and Grow Rich, which has sold 50 million copies. Now, his brain must have been working right because he was thinking about money and he certainly earned plenty. So it, it definitely worked for Napoleon Hill. But I know a lot of other people that are that book has helped enormously too. It is about our belief. It is only our belief that holds us away from the magic that we can create. If, uh, let me just, I was looking for something that I had written just as a note. Actually, I had a moment, here we are. It, it's all a moment of connecting with spirit and listening to what I'm being guided to share with you. So here it is. Worrying is a total waste of energy and a sign of faith that is gone. Now, that to me is so absolutely obvious. However, it could be magic for someone who just had a different perspective on worrying. Worrying takes so much of our time. Is it more powerful to believe in magic than to believe in worrying. <laughs> Think about it. How 
often do we spend time worrying when if we turn it around and believe in magic, we could just let it go and enjoy our lives. We're really here supposed to be having fun. Life is supposed to be fun. I've had a lot of fun today. And just before we went on the air, you were saying that I had a big smile on my face. And I said, well, I have, because um, it's been a great day. And my mind was on this show, you know, wondering what we were going to talk about. And uh, there was definitely some magic happened because... I had an email uh, last night. Uh, Paul McKenna, who some of you know, he received a note from a, a, a TV documentary producer, and this producer was making a documentary about luck, and they asked McKenna if he wanted to be on the show. And he was traveling somewhere else, so he very generously gave these people my name. And um, I said, yeah, sounds like fun, definitely will love to do something. But then I didn't hear anything about it. And as so many things happen, I thought this was a project, you know, that somebody had thought was a good idea and it wasn't going to happen. Well, that is until I had an email this morning that the film crew had just left and would be with me in two hours. So I had to rearrange all of those plans that I had for the day. The film crew turned up and they wanted to know my views on luck. That was pretty easy. And then they wanted me to give them some practical advice on, you know, maybe they could, you know, go into a casino and put all their money on red and win the money or something like that. Well, I didn't think that was a very good idea. But I was talking to the producer. And as I spoke to him, incredible story unraveled. This is a guy who's in his late 20s. Uh, he said, the last year has been totally unlucky for me. And I'm really hoping that something of what you say is going to turn my luck today. He said, I've had two major operations for cancer of the bowel, and apparently this is an inherited condition that he has. But he was really, really ill, and he was describing the tension of waiting outside for the results, you know, six days later, knowing that it was going to be really, really bad news. And it was. And he, and when I say major surgery, I mean major, major surgery. He was just pulling himself together after that, and he was knocked over by a car and broke his leg. He was just about recovering from that, when he had a problem with his eye and he went to the doctor and he had a cancer on his eye that required surgery and it was going to be done under local anesthetic. And he started getting more and more tense as he was telling me this story. And he said, and of course, I have two phobias. I have a phobia of spiders. Well, that's quite common. He said, but I have a phobia of people touching my eyes. And, and I was just, this operation was maybe the smallest compared to the others, but it was the most terrifying for me. And I realized that this young man was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. So I said, well, look, um, let's change the plans. Would, would you like a little bit of therapy? Would you like me to try a couple of techniques on you that just might help? And of course, he bit my hand off. You can see the blood still dripping from the sticky end of it. <laughs> <laughs> so as usual, I didn't have much time. We were on a very tight shooting schedule. So... Um, the, the fastest way to do work is to put people into trance. So I dropped him into a hypnotic trance. I used this havening technique that we've talked about in another program where you stroke your arms. And I got him to breathe using a heart math technique, which we've also talked about in our previous programs. And I got him to relive the experience, but I changed the emotions. I put it into a different part of his brain. And, and basically, I took the energy and the passion, uh, the energy and the uh, the emotion, out of those bad memories, and I brought to the fore some very very happy memories of when he was in flow and in the zone and full of confidence, and they kind of overwhelmed the other memories. Well, before I started, I asked him to describe his level of anxiety, which ranges from zero to being absolutely laid back, like you always are to being 10, you know, having a, an absolute panic attack. And he said, I'm about an eight or a nine, and I could see that he was. Anyway, after our therapy, and I would say we did it all in about 20 minutes, I guess, it seemed to go a lot faster than that. When he opened his eyes, it was a different man's face, and he looked very, very confused. And I said, how was that, as I always do? And he was struggling for the words. He said, it was odd. He said, I know that's a stupid thing to say, but it's odd. I said, well, what's odd about it? He said, well, I just feel different. I, I'm certainly not worrying about things, um, but I don't know why. 
And I said, OK, well, give me the level. What is it? Not to 10. Not to 10. It was an 8 or a 9 before. He said, well, it's almost gone. I would say maybe a 2. <laughs> and I tell you, we've got that on film. And I just can't wait to see that footage. And um, I'm looking, you know, those people that we talked about earlier that don't believe in magic, I'm going to make sure they all see it. Because if they can explain that, um, then they're a better man than I am. Brilliant. I absolutely love this. It's all about change of focus. If we keep saying, oh, my goodness, this year is being the worst year of my life. I can't believe what's going to happen next. Uh, I am not making fun of this these people because obviously it can be very very traumatic and I do understand it but it is imperative that we listen to what we're saying can we hear our voices are they saying it's oh it's a very rainy day it was rainy yesterday too it'll probably rain tomorrow and guess what you know, we could probably even affect the weather. I'm not surprised if we could. So, yes, I believe 100% in shifting focus. And that's the magic that you created in that whole exercise. We do a lot of this, both you and I, in our separate ways of how we deal with clients. And that's what could change that number in moments. Yes, so important. Yeah, and of course, I'm not, I'm not laughing at these people who don't believe in magic either, because I'm actually painfully aware, as I said on a previous show, that, um, I, I, you know, I was one of them. I was brought up as a very traditional scientist, but it took um, a trauma in my life before I began to see that there was other stuff, and that's so often the case. Another interesting thing about my session with the producer today is perhaps something that others might be able to use. Because when I was trying to bring up some positive emotions, I asked him, you know, when, he, when had he felt really good in the zone? And I, I didn't get him to tell me. I just asked him to nod, you know, when he'd got something. And then I asked him to, in his mind to come up with one word that would describe how he felt that day. And he got that. And then I said, if that word has a color, uh, what would the color be? And he got that. So when he came out of trance, I spoke to him. His wonderful memory was just when he was getting over his broken leg, actually, before the next bad thing happened. And he'd taken up tennis again and he would had a lesson and he hadn't played for years. He'd obviously been a really good tennis player and he just played out of his skin. And he was so happy, he forgot all of his problems and, you know, was just buzzing for a whole day afterwards. And his word, which is a strange one. Well, no word is strange, but I've never heard it before when I do this technique. He said... The word was clinical. He felt clinical about it. And his color was red. So I said, well, great. Now, when you're faced with adversity again, or when you're just doing something and you need to feel really, really good, how can you use this word and, and the color to remind yourself? And he said, I know exactly what I'm going to do. And he was even showing me with his fingers. He said, I'm going to buy a key ring with a big red tennis racket on it. So every time I get my key ring out of my pocket, it's going to remind me of how good I felt that day. And I could see he was going to do it. This is like the work I do. I love this. And, <clears throat> of course, my work surrounds sound and color and connecting it with the feeling. And uh, when, when I hear my clients, who, particularly the older people, uh, having to think about what something might be in a different color how how would i explain that in color they really have to think hard whereas a child who is open and ready for anything can give you an immediate color when you say what color does that word have for you they just say blue or green or whatever it's just magic and then also they can put a note to it a sound to it which absolutely solidifies their agreement with the you know, with all of creation because this is what it's all about we are all sound we're all color if we can only see our colors we would blind ourselves because there are amazing auras all around us. And some people have a gift of being able to see all of these. I don't have that gift, but I sense it. 
And that's about all I can do at the moment. And that doesn't matter. But at some point, I'm sure I will be blinded by the colors. And uh, go ahead. I would like you to speak now. <laughs> I mean, you're blowing me away with this conversation. And um, <laughs> it, it's actually so relevant to something that I was going to say. And we talked about colors and notes and auras and things on a previous program. And I've always been, you know, you know that I do my meditation every morning. and I'm always thinking of things like this. And how can I meditate deeper and get a better score and things like that. And I feel that my particular energy or chakra that's um, the important one is around my heart. And you mentioned, I remember you said, ah, that's the note F. So on my computer, I just had a, I made a, an F note, a, an organ, just playing this note constantly. And then I also feel that I have a chakra in the top of my head and the color for that is um, violet. And there I've got some violet crystals that I have in my office. And the note for that, I think, is B. I'm not a new musician, but I can press the right key on the keyboard. So I made this note of F and B, and then I mixed them together and played it as a chord. And I meditated on that for eight minutes, and uh, I didn't get my highest ever score in the last six years. It was one of my top three best scores, and a lot higher than it has been recently because I've been you know, working too hard, basically. So there you are, how we can use color and music and thoughts and meditation. All of these things are definitely ingredients that bring us closer to magic. Thank you. And earlier, you brought up something about a spider, I mm. believe. You talked. I did. You did. Incy wincy. <laughs> well, I had an experience uh, some 15 years ago where life wasn't feeling too good. And I was on my way driving to meet a friend to actually get a little solace from my friend and to be uh, nurtured back into reality at that moment. I needed something outside of me to look into the eyes of somebody I knew who cared. And as I was driving there, I was deep in thought and I was perhaps even emotional behind the wheel. But I came to a stop sign and as I pulled up, a spider dropped down on the hood of my car in front of my windshield. And I was mesmerized by it. I almost missed the traffic light because I was so looking at it because it was in the middle of nowhere. The spider appeared. Anyway, needless to say, soon after that, wisdom and rhyme came into play and as Sophocles and Andante gave me this. Well, that's very kind of them, and we all want to hear it. Come on, Mari. <laughs> it's entitled, The Spider Idea. Just look at the risks a spider takes when it sets out to build its home. I'm sure if it were thought of the risks involved, it would never begin to roam. A spider doesn't say, oh, but what if... It just trusts that it has all the tools and we can all do the same, though others may think we're fools. When we study the intricate pattern of the web that the spider does weave, it is clear that it knows just what to do. All it has to do is believe. How often we instigate failure when doubting our God-given gifts we could trust life just like the spider and then watch how the world surely shifts. I know, because I'm doing this now and it's coming abundantly clear. I'm traveling with no net below me and trusting the spider idea. Well, that was beautiful. I have to say that I have a considerable affection and respect for spiders, uh, unlike my daughter, who is one of these spider phobics. <laughs> and she's in Australia at the moment, about the worst place she could be. But now correct me on my history. I'm not very good on that, especially Scottish history. But was it Bruce or somebody who was holed up in a cave watching a spider make a web? I think you're right, Robert the Bruce. Robert uh -huh. the Bruce, it was indeed. And... Uh, 
And, and I think that gave him inspiration. I can't remember the details, but I think the English had been bullying him or something. I'm afraid the English have got this sort of reputation, which is unfortunately well deserved. Anyway, it gave him strength to carry on the fight because he was watching this spider making its intricate web. And I've watched spiders as well. And, you know, the wind will blow and their web will get blown away. What do they do? They just start again and they construct this. And how do they do it? How do they make a, a spy? How do I don't know. We couldn't do it, even, we, even if we had a machine. So that's a bit more magic. Now, I've got another example that I wanted to bounce off you. Um, coincidences, they're, they're magic. Coincidences, when unexpected things keep happening, um, when there's a whole sequ sequence of events that each one of them is unlikely, putting the whole lot together is even more unlikely. And I didn't know until I started researching this word synchronous or synchronicity. The, the term was coined by a psychologist called Carl Jung. I mean, he worked with Freud and really is, so that's a sort of the latest generation of um, psychologists and psychotherapists. And he was a student, I think, of Freud. But anyway, he, he became convinced that synchronicity was not random, just as I'm convinced that luck is not random. And he had some views which are very difficult to understand about the collective unconscious and how we're all bound together and so nothing ever does happen randomly. He exchanged these views with Einstein. Uh, I think they were living maybe close together. But Einstein was very open to this as well. Now, here's a little bit of science, I'll, and I'll keep it real simple because I have to because I don't know much about science. Einstein was famous for his theory of relativity. And the theory of relativity governs how big bodies attract each other. And then along came, a, everything was very good with that, everybody was happy with it, and along came another scientist, and I think his name was Max Planck, and he came up with, the, with quantum theory, and quantum theory predicts how tiny, tiny particles, subatomic particles, will actually interact with each other, and everything worked fine with his theory. The problem is, is that they both can't be right, and Einstein knew that, Planck knew that, and Einstein said, you know, maybe not in my time, but one, t one day there will be a unified theory that explains all of this. And I think that's, what, that's the realm of what we call magic at the moment. Because someday somebody is going to understand what all this synchronicity is and why we get these incredible coincidences and why some people are luckier than others. Um, I don't know whether I want that day to come. I mean, I like it at the moment because everything is so mysterious and difficult to understand. If everything was explained, it would be like a magician showing you how they do their tricks. What do you think, Mari? Do you want to know everything about it now? No, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> I truly live in the moment. Obviously, there are times when I have to set up appointments, but in this moment is when a, I have my greatest power. And the one thing that was coming to me and coming to my mind right at this moment is time bending. I believe this also relates to magic. I've had many situations where time bending came in and that to me is so magical. I remember one specific time living in Washington, D.C., or rather in the suburbs of Washington, and having a meeting to attend that was probably about half an hour away from my home. And this young gentleman and I were getting ready to go to the meeting, and all of a sudden we noticed that it was five minutes before the meeting was due to begin. How that time, I, I don't know what happened. However, we both looked at each other and we knew we were in big trouble because we had to go across town in the middle of rush hour traffic. He said, oh, well, you know, we're not going to make it. And I said, OK, we're going to make it. Think positively. Absolutely stay with me on this. <laughs> and he had a little sports car and we get on the highway and the traffic was jammed totally jammed and I saw my raincoat on the floor and I picked it up and I stuck it inside my shirt and I began to writhe in the chair and I said point to my tummy and peep your horn <laughs> <laughs> so he did that and all of these cars started moving across the highway making gangway for us to go down the highway we made it 
with about half a minute to spare, and I still don't know how we did it. I know that the people that we were meeting with were cheering us as we ran through the door because they were waiting for us. And I still think about that time, and I know our clocks were right. I know everything about it. I also know the only thing I did was stick that silly coat up inside my shirt and made myself look like I was going to have a baby. <laughs> oh, dear. Things we do. The things we do. Well, you know, um, there's a hint for all the listeners. If you're late for your meeting, follow Mari's <laughs> advice and stuff something up your shirt. Um, I'll, I'll try that too, but I doubt I'll have the same effect. <laughs> Are you ready for a little bit more science? This is the last bit of science, of unless course. I have a brainwave or something. Um, there's an experiment going on in Europe at the moment. They call it the Hadron Collider. They built this big circle just about all the way around Switzerland, and they are firing subatomic particles at each other at speeds approaching the speed of light. And that is where they found the God particle. Uh, did you read that about in the newspapers? No. It's called, I think, it, or do they call it the boson particle, the God particle? Yeah, it's, it's the, the, the greatest mystery of, of physics. It had been predicted by a British scientist, and nobody quite knew when it would be found, but they found it. They found this God particle. And I think they're going to find a lot of, a lot of other things too. But it's important that we trust these scientists, because, like I say, they're firing subatomic particles at each other at very, very high speeds. And this person, the director, was being interviewed. It's called CERN. It's called the CERN Research Center. And he said, we're beginning to know a lot of stuff now. There are many, many unknowns. And when I think of these people in their white coats doing all this kind of stuff with unknown unknowns i'm waiting for a huge explosion and I'm, I'm hoping that i'm far enough away from them i certainly hope so i don't choose to be in in between those firings however i i know as long as i believe that i'm safe and i'm in good hands i will be and I trust that it's like when harry and i take off every time we go out driving anywhere we say a little prayer. And it's funny because we're in a, an area where there are bears, there's deer, there's lots of wild animals, and they jump out on the highway very regularly. So when I say that my prayer, I always include that they would be safe, that the animals would be safe too. And now and again, Harry will turn to me and he'll say, hey, Murray, keep a lookout on the road because, you know, there's, this is an area where there's often bears. And I'll say, I already said my prayer. I trust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he think, oh, yes, you're right. <laughs> it is amazing how often we say a prayer or we have a wish and we don't trust it. The key word is trust when we have to make preparations, but then when we've made them, we have to trust them. However we feel about them, trust. Key word. It is, it is. I believe I am a good driver, an excellent driver. You believe driver. you are. Well, I know that you have a lot of trust and you have a lot of belief, but I mean, if your driver, if your driving was a little bit on the dodgy side and maybe a bit fast, um, it's probably good that you are praying for the best safety as well. <laughs> Well, actually, Harry just suggested that I say the prayer because uh, we I said it in front of some young people the other day and they said, oh, my God, that's a really neat prayer. And I said, OK, here you go. Thank you, God, for our safe journeys, steady hands and watchful eyes, letting everyone, including the furry animals, be safe as we pass by. And thank you, God, for a technically trouble-free drive. Amen. Yeah, that's nice. Work it covers works it all. You, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'll go with that. <laughs> well, I think we've just about touched every base of magic. And I so love your input. And what I'm going to be thinking about it for quite a while now. All the little magical turns that we took on this journey. However, I want to know if you have something particular in mind for our next show topic, or are we going to let that be magic? 
um i don't have anything to be quite honest i'm looking forward to the next show because um i definitely you know you've heard a lot of the work that i'm doing and i've the seven secrets you're all experts you all know as much as i do now and i hope you're using it but i'm really looking forward to hearing some of the stuff that you do mari i mean i know you do an awful lot of healing and therapy and i'm, I'm hoping you know you're gonna i'm sure you are gonna bring some of these things to our next show and i'm i'm just going to be sitting back in or absorbing it all like a sponge. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, when I was in spirit right now, I was just totally inspired with your words, and healing jumped right out of there because I know that we have a lot of gifts to give the world surrounding healing and what we, our journeys have been in the healing arena, shall we say. So perhaps we should just talk about healing and touch on many avenues. What do you think about that? I think that's a great idea. I'm, I'm really glad you said that. And as we always say on these shows, uh, we, you know, we want to know what the listeners think. Uh, we want to know perhaps if they have healing experiences. What about if they would like some healing themselves? So we could do some healing on air. That would be good. Yes. Be in touch. Thank you for listening today. And have a brilliant day. And remember, everything is magic. It certainly is, Mari. Thank you very much for co-presenting the show with me, having you on your show. Thank you, Harry, as usual, for all of the things that you do with wires <laughs> that involve <laughs> magic. Angel Corner Retreat Radio is produced by Happy Radio Network in our studios in McLeod, California. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>